so vampires. Yeah. <laughs> What's up with the vampires? vampires? What's up with the vampires? Okay. Um, I was about 14 years old, I guess, when I um, went with a bunch of junior high classmates to, what was that? Yeah, I guess eighth grade, ninth grade, somewhere around there anyway. Um, went to see a replay of the 1930s Dracula with Bela Lugosi. Saw the play of that in the nearby student theater. It wasn't so good. No, yeah. but it it affected me because here all of my friends and you know other quote horror movies, everybody's joking and laughing around, and they start out and here it's a very simple black and white overacted Bella chewed the scenery, but still the audience got quiet and. I'm looking around and seeing these kids, you know, sort of creeping down in their chairs, watching this thing, and thought, "Wow, this is this, this is really sort of neat." And then they did the Frankenstein with um, again 1930s black and white, but they were acted. So I went. I got the book. Dracula, Bram Stoker, and I read it, and it's dated, it's Victorian, it's got way too many words, but, um, well, I think Tolkien has way too many words. I think Tolkien yeah. suffered from, uh, needed a really good editor. But the more I learned about um, Bram Stoker and why he wrote Dracula and what it was all about, I just became more and more fascinated with the character read things about the historic Vlad Tepish, um, or Vlad Dracul, uh, son of the dragon, is what it came out as, who was uh, actually a Romanian hero huh. to uh, his people, not to the Turks, who he was impaling, um, but it was said during his brief reign um, that a virgin, naked, carrying a chest of gold, could walk from one end of his kingdom to the other, and neither the gold nor the virgin would be touched. Um, I mean, it was a police state, but um, the Turks basically, after a few incidents such as his nailing the turban to the head of the Turkish ambassador, who Ugh. refused to remove his, his hat in Vlad's presence and literally putting um, some of the Turkish soldiers, uh, impaling them and leaving them out in the fields and then having a banquet in the middle of the field, convinced them that he was crazy if not the devil and they sort of went around him when they were attacking uh, Romania. And there were various other movies later that were made um, based loosely, for the most part, um, about Dracula, Bram Stoker's story. Um, very good one with um, Jack Palance as Dracula. Um, there was a version with Frank Languella, who was a very sexy Dracula. Um, an interesting one with, um, oh God, French actor who was pretty and very imperious. Um, and I noticed how this story, which was basically a potboiler, um, had many different interpretations and a lot of people doing it. Um, then I had the opportunity to play the role in Summerstock in 1959, and uh, that was an interesting experience. Um, it was the classic um, play version of it, uh, but we did a live on-stage disappearance and did it in theater in the round without a flash pot or anything like that, um, and that was that was really cool. What would a live on-stage disappearance be? Um, there is this scene where just before the end, where Dracula is 
in um, the house and he's being exposed by Von Helsing and by Seward and he disappears just before dawn and then they go down into the crypt and find him and in the last scene and they stake him and he dies and that's the end. And Lucy goes off with Stuart who I always felt was a wimp. Um, actually it's not Lucy, it's Mina. But the, um, the movie actually combined the Lucy and Mina characters, the original uh, one with Bela Lugosi. Uh, later, and particularly the uh, version that Francis Ford Coppola did, uh, treats them as the separate characters, the way they were written. But in any event, typically it's Don Dracula is standing behind a couch and they expose him and there's a flash pot that goes off and he ducks down behind the couch and he's gone. Well, we couldn't do that because it was theater in the round. Fortunately, the theater had trap doors in the stage. And so when I come out for that scene, I'm wearing a cape. Now understand, the cape never appeared in the book Dracula. There is no description anywhere in the book of Dracula wearing a cape. But because it was part of the 1930s movie, it became classic or canon. So, if you're going to do Dracula, you've got to have a cape. Um, anyway, I came out wearing a cape, of course, white tie and tails and all of that, and part of the denouement, I flip, it's a hooded cape, and I flip the hood up. Now, what the audience didn't know is the cape was gimmick. There was a shoulder harness in there, and there were basically fish lines going from my shoulders and from the hood up into the grid. So there was a uh, stagehand who, once I got into position and flipped the hood, took the tension up on the fish line. And I had, a few months before, had gotten my first pair of corneal contact lenses, and they check the fit rubbing with a fluorescent uh, dye. I managed to talk my ophthalmologist into giving me some of the dye. So before I went on, I put a drop in each eye, and they had an ultraviolet spotlight focused on my face. So with the hood, you can see these green glowing eyes. And what happened is deliver the line, and the actors playing Seward and Von Helsing basically did a cross in front of me. And as soon as they were blocking me from that side of the audience, I just went down inside the cape, which is being held by the stagehand, through the trap door. And then as they lunge for it, the cape just falls to the ground. So, you know, disappeared. The end of the run, I was taking off the makeup the last night, getting ready to go to a cast party. Guy came down to the dressing room, said, okay, the show is over. I've watched this from every quadrant of the theater. Would you tell me now how the hell you did the disappearance? So that started the whole thing. Then several months later, um, I was working for a commercial radio station. One of the disc jockeys um, got a job to host a late night monster movie show on local television in Columbus. And the gimmick that we start out with was um, show was on Friday, Friday at midnight. Uh, Thursday, we would find out what the sponsor, which was sort of like a Sonny's surplus, some place that just had odd lots and things like that, what they wanted to promote, we would come up with three live commercials and design, I would design monster makeup that had something to do with the, whatever the, whatever they wanted to sell. So for example, when they were selling Indian blankets, 
I would do him, um, you know, as an Indian. Um, I don't know if that counts as a monster. Uh, when he's got an arrow sticking out of him and um, bloody scars, that, we did a Jekyll and Hyde change, and we did other things. It was a got in a twelve week contract, and I was being paid to do three complete makeup changes on the guy, in, basically in less than two hours. Um, and it was fine for six weeks, and then he left to take a better job at a station in out of state. The sponsor really wasn't happy with the results of the show, uh, but he'd signed a 12-week contract with the TV station. Uh, so I said, well, tell you what, I did Dracula in Summer Stock. I'll host as a vampire, because I can't do three complete changes of makeup on myself in the two-hour period. Uh, but I'll do it as a vampire, and you can you pay me the talent fee that you were paying uh, Sherman, but you save the cost of the makeup artist fee. And so I went with it. So I did six weeks of late night monster movie host as a classic vampire, white tie, tails, medallion, wig, contact lenses, fangs. Uh, that was where I got my first pair of fangs. I went to the um, dentist who had um, done my braces and stuff, and um, he made me a pair of acrylic fangs. On stage Dracula didn't get fangs? On stage Dracula um, didn't have fangs. Didn't have the glowing eyes, didn't have the fangs. Um, and that's where I learned how to speak with fangs in your mouth, and if you make them too long, you lift. And somehow, I'm sorry, but a lisping vampire really isn't too scary uh, unless somebody's a horrible homophobe and makes the wrong um, <laughs> idea. But um, having been working, well, it's, no, that was just before I started working for the speech and hearing clinic. So, um, when totally off the subject, Dark Shadows was a soap opera that wasn't doing very well until they introduced a vampire character, Barnabas Collins, and then it became a cult thing, cult television show. A soap but opera that out of nowhere just introduced a vampire? Basically, yeah. They, they introduced an a, um, old vampire, and then they had other vampires later and werewolves and other things. But um, it was an afternoon black and white soap. Can you genre shift? Uh, yeah, it was a, a genre shift. What can I say? It was the 50s. You know, there are only three television stations in most towns. Some of the big cities had a fourth. But anyway, it turned out that if they had long enough fangs to really show up in the low-res black and white television, it made you lisp. So they had to loop the dialogue. They had to film the stuff and then record the dialogue separately. Um, so when I'm doing... Um, Baldicon, for example, I have small fangs. I mean, they're there, but I can do the whole thing without lisping. If I'm going for a photo session, I have much longer fangs, so they show up better uh, on camera. Anyway, um, so I did the six weeks, and that went bye-bye. And other than doing a vampire for a couple of Halloween parties, I sort of put the character away until I started um, running the masquerade at Baldicon in, well, 1979. Um, the first MC, I, I was running programming for Baldicon, and I decided that we should have a Friday night, because it was Friday the 13th of April that year, uh, we would have a monster rally, and I got Dick Dizel. Uh, who played Gore Duvall on Channel 20 in D.C. Um, to be the host. He did a vampire host. Actually, Dick did a whole bunch of characters. He was Captain 20, which was uh, when they were showing um, space opera, and he was Gore Duvall doing a late-night monster host and uh, two or three other things. And he still does Gore Duvall on the website, on his website and other things. But anyway... Uh, Dick 
emceed the first year. And then I decided, what the hell? And I started emceeing afterward, after that. But things can go wrong. And in those days, there was no such thing as a rehearsal. So sometimes they would get the music wrong or uh, miss the cue or whatever, and that's when I started telling bad vampire jokes when something went wrong to fill the time. Wait, actually, real quick, I'm a little bit confused. The um, the Monster Alley thing, you mentioned Balticon. Is that how Balticon started? That's, that's how Balticon's Masquerade thing. started. Right. Okay. Before that, it was sort of catch as catch can, and actually, the, the first year that I went to Balticon was, I think, Balticon 11 was in 1977. Um, the costume competition was in the Rathskeller at Hunt Valley, which you could only get to by going down a 30-inch wide curving stairway, because it was down in the basement. It's now um, the lunchroom for the employees. It was definitely not very accessible and had low ceilings and not very good light. And I remembered uh, costume competitions or masquerades from science fiction conventions that I'd gone to previously, and they were I thought they were wonderful things. So I dragged the masquerade out of the basement at Hunt Valley, basically, put it in the main tent, and... Uh, that was the first year that I had to apply to file my taxes later <laughs> because I got so involved with the programming uh, at Baldicon. And so I said, okay, I do not want to run programming for Baldicon again, but the masquerade was fun, so let me run that. And uh, so I've been doing it ever since. And, well, part of the fun is being able to come out to the John Williams Dracula theme uh, with Howling Wolves and go, Good evening and welcome to Balticon 45. Uh, and so I've been emceeing ever since. And as I said, I've got a notebook that thick full of bad vampire jokes. One-liners, you know, vampire idea of fast food. <laughs> someone with high blood pressure, uh, to shaggy dog stories that can be dragged out for five or six minutes, which if when, one time when the sound, uh, circuit breaker blew and they had no sound, well, having worked in theater, I can project. Good. So while they were fixing the sound, I did this shaggy dog vampire story that I think probably ran about six minutes until they signaled me that they had fixed the, the problem with the sound. So, it's fun. And I have friends who have been running a haunted attraction for, well, this will be the 19th year, called Castle Blood out in western Pennsylvania. And from the time they started it, Ricky Dick would call me up and say, Marty, you got to come out and play, play at the castle. And I had one excuse after another not to go out there. And finally, uh, nine, ten years ago, for their tenth anniversary, uh, he called me. He said, look, it's our tenth anniversary. Come out for one weekend. And I said, okay, I'll come out for one weekend. And I had so much fun. I just had a really good time hamming it up and doing vampire on the front porch, freezing my fanny off because it gets very cold and damp in that part of it's like an hour south and east of Pittsburgh. Um, that the next year I went back for two weekends. The year after that I went back for four. My wife threatened to shoot me if I ever did it again. She did not like being alone all, every weekend in October. Um, then, the year after that, she left me, uh, which I thought was horribly unfair. And I ran away from home a whole bunch. She died. She had pancreatic cancer. And, uh, 
five weeks from discovery until passing. And so I, I really ran away a whole, a whole bunch that the rest of that summer. I just didn't want to be in the house. Um, and so, except for last year when I had triple bypass surgery, um, ever since then I have gone back to Castle Blood for every weekend in October. And I get to do different vampires. There's Uncle Vlad, who wears white tie and tails and a wig with a uh, widow's peak. And tells the bad vampire jokes. Tell bad vampire jokes and so on. Um, there's a Nosferatu character that I do who has double pointed ears and is bald and has doubled fangs and is evil. And where I say that Uncle Vlad would seduce you into giving some of your blood because you just couldn't refuse him. The Nosferatu wouldn't ask you. He would grab you, rip your throat out, drain your corpse completely dry, and be sure to throw it someplace where people would trip over it. Uh, he's really scary, and I, I get to really go there when I'm frequently, when I'm doing him, it's on the front porch where we're setting the stage or the scene for what's going to happen at Castle Blood. And the idea is to scare them before they ever even come in. Um, and part of the castle is the lair of the vampires. The storyline is when the vampires came to America, they chartered a boat to bring them here. Um, they didn't know they were chartering a pirate boat. And the pirates didn't know who their passengers were. So, well, some of the pirates became vampires and the rest became lunch. Uh, and it's a very popular area at Castle Blood, so I created a vampiret character that I call Old Bilge. And Old Bilge only has one eye, but he was a real pirate before he became a vampire, you know, and he's got the red velvet pirate coat and tricorn hat and the droopy gray mustache and stringy long gray hair and sometimes he has really wicked scars uh, depending on how much time I have to do the makeup and, um, and a couple of other characters so I'm combining hobbies in that I get to do the costumes for uh, the vampire characters uh, and design the makeup and then ham it up hopefully not too much, uh, and play the character there. Uh, so that, that's why the vampires, because it's fun to do, and it's become, well, Marty's signature, so I, yeah. you know, other people have um, alligators on their shirts, I have bats. And Makes sense. I, well, somewhere along the line, I learned how to make my own fangs out of dental acrylic, as you well know, so yeah. uh, I get to do that or teach people how to do that um, and have great good fun. And I have to admit, um, one of the things that I found very interesting about the vampire character, even into the 50, late 50s when I was doing it, is apparently it's uh, quite a sexy character because I received a couple of propositions from some very attractive ladies when I was doing it on stage who wanted to have sex with me but wanted me to keep the makeup on. Yes. So that was, that was an interesting uh, experience. And we won't go any farther than that. Okay. Okay. So where do you want to go from there? Um, that might actually be enough because we need like four pages. So, okay. Think, so, thank you. You are most welcome. <laughs>